Okay. All right, guys. Pray in Jesus' almighty name for the glory of the Father, the Son, Holy Spirit, that this session is powerfully anointed, blessed, and the internet connection stays super strong in Jesus' name, right? <clears throat> well, keep praying for me, Lisa, uh, to really lose all this excessive weight with the grace of Jesus Christ to get my health back and to be holy and sold out for the glory of Jesus Christ. Now, if you guys are wondering why the times are not set that I live stream at different hours, because I want you to keep in, keep this in mind. In Jesus' name, I'm living in a new state, and this is the place I'll be here for the foreseeable future, because the Lord Jesus brought me here, and I know he's going to keep me here. I don't have a place of my own yet. So pray for that. Pray in Jesus' name that within the upcoming month or two, I find a place, the Lord provide my daily needs and provide through me for my children to continue to do this work for the glory of Jesus. And then I can have a set schedule. Right now I can't have a set schedule because I'm at my eldest brother's home. And whenever they're not here is when I have the opportunity to live stream. So they're not here right now. And so it's not going to be set until I get my own place. So I hope you understand that and and appreciate that. In fact, I know that within a half an hour, David Wood, Hater Wood's going to go live and he gets about a thousand. I barely get 200. <laughs> but anyway, pray about it. All right. So in Jesus name, may he beatify me so I can just shine with the beauty of Jesus. All right. So let's wait for some more faces to show up. I will finish. The discussion that we started two sessions ago on women in ministry, and we're going to look at 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. And by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be done with this topic. So let me repeat again. If you take a contrary position from the one <clears throat> that I'm espousing, articulating, that's fine. If you think I'm wrong, that's fine. If I thought I was wrong, then I wouldn't be sharing this position. So if I'm wrong, here's my prayer. In Jesus' almighty name, may the Holy Spirit convict me to show me where I'm wrong and give me the grace to correct myself and protect you from all errors in Jesus' name. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the perfect teacher and he guides us into all truth and he preserves us, protects us, sanctifies us, corrects us for the glory of Jesus. But until I'm convinced I'm wrong, there's no need for you to try to debate me on this issue because if I were can convince that your position is right, then I'd be articulating that position, right? So take what I have to say, prayerfully study the passages, the arguments, and trust the Holy Spirit to guide you into all truth and protect you from error, right? So that's what I want you to do. I don't want you to believe blindly anything I say. I just want you to take the points I give you, study them, and if you think I'm wrong, that's fine. Honestly, let me let me just say it again. I'm okay with people not agreeing with me. What I'm not okay with is people trying to debate me, prove I'm wrong, and then bombard my comment section with 50,000 word posts will get you blocked. And welcome, Muhammad Faridi. If you guys don't know, yeah, the Father, Son, Spirit, yeah, the Father, Son, Spirit. In Jesus, Lord, constrain me, crucify my flesh, and give me the power to be patient. If you guys don't know who Muhammad Faridi is, he's a former Shia Muslim who's now sold out for the Lord Jesus Christ, and him and I do ministry together. So pray for him and his ministry. Okay. And let me give you a passage. I want this passage to be etched in your heart by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, here's a passage I want you guys to memorize. Proverbs 18, verse 17. Proverbs 18, verse 17. And by the way, subscribe to his YouTube channel. Proverbs 18 to 17, it says, The first to present his case seems right until another comes and questions him. Proverbs 18, verse 17. The first to present his case seems right until another comes and questions him. Right? King James says it, but his neighbor cometh and searcheth him. Okay, do you see that passage, Proverbs 18, 17? Etch it in your heart. Here's what you do. Here's what I want you to do. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to daily pray, Holy Spirit, pray it in your own way. Holy Spirit, you are my God, my Lord, my love, my life, my creator, my maker, my sustainer, my life giver, my savior, my redeemer who preserves me for the glory of Jesus. 
I trust in you to guide me into all truth, to save me from error, save me from sin, and make me more like Jesus. So guide me, please, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name. Pray that daily. That's my prayer. Praise God, we got another ex-Muslim. Muhammad Faridi, we got another ex-Muslim. Now, folks, this is going to be focused on biblical doctrine. If you guys want to go and listen to David Wood, be my guest. He's a brother in the Lord Jesus, and I hate to love him, and he loves to hate me. They're going to be focusing more on Islamic topics. So if you want to stay here and just focus on biblical doctrines and listen to his stream when it's archived, feel free. If you want to listen to him live and then listen to mine later, feel free. Okay. So, but I'm going to be focusing on biblical doctrines. This is why David Wood and I perfectly complement one another. Here's why. He focuses on exposing Islam, and I focus on refuting objections against the core doctrines of the Christian faith and teaching Christians by the power of the Holy Spirit what they're supposed to believe and why, right? So this is why we make a great team. So over 90% of my materials on my YouTube channel and on the websites focus on affirming, explaining core doctrines of the Christian faith. So the thing is, we have some Christians who focus more on refuting Islam and they're not grounded in the authority of scriptures and why they're supposed to believe what they believe on the basis of scriptures. So we need to know our Bible much better than we know the Islamic sources and then trust the Holy Spirit to give us the power to live the truths of scripture for the glory of Jesus. Amen? Yeah, it is. So let's just begin in prayer. And please pray for the resolution and the internet connectivity to stay strong. Because in my brother's home, his internet connection is not the best. But this is all I have for now. Okay. So let's just come in agreement and say, we love you, Father. We love you, Lord Jesus, the Father's beloved Son, his very heart who became flesh. And we love you, Holy Spirit. Father, be glorified in and through us. And please, Father, bless this session in the power of the Holy Spirit. Anoint my mouth to speak only truth without error. Save me from confusion. Save me from stammering. And bless your people, Father, with wisdom and knowledge from your Holy Spirit as you guide us to know your word, to affirm your word, to love your word, proclaim your word, and even die for your word, Father. May the Lord Jesus increase in us and may we decrease. Make us more like Jesus to light your heart, Father. And please, Father, provide for our daily needs. Save me from my trials and plant me here and bring my children to me and bless them, Father, and fill them with your love. Wash them, wash us in the blood of Jesus and seal us and seal them with and by your Holy Spirit. We need you, Father. Save us from the evil one and destroy all distractions. And Father, enable me to recall scripture perfectly and exegete it correctly. And give us the power to live your word and bless the internet connectivity, Father. Everything good is from you, and we need you, Father. We truly do. We love you, Father. We love you, Abba. We love you, Avinu. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. All right. Everyone with me? By the way, for you Assyrians, I was listening to an Assyrian jam. Man, I'm addicted to it. Maybe I'll post a little later. But for now, last night's session, building the wounds for Zoom. Yeah, we're going to address another passage that was used against me to show that women cannot teach in a mixed congregation. Right? Now, let me just repeat. Yep, Gilu music. Let me just repeat again. There is nothing in Scripture that says women can be pastors slash bishops, slash overseers, slash elders. So I'm not saying a woman can be a bishop. What I'm saying is that according to the God-breathed scriptures, women can teach, can pray, can prophesy in a mixed congregation, and women can be deacons, what we call deaconesses, and you even have women <clears throat> who are called apostles, and we even have female prophets, prophetesses, and I documented that from the Old and New Testaments, so that's inarguable. But as far as bishop is concerned, that position is limited to males only. And even though people want to argue that there are female bishops, I'm sorry to say there is no biblical support for that. Now, you may disagree with me. That's fine. But the burden of proof is on you to show otherwise, right? 
Well, Lumberto, what is a deacon? If you go to Acts 6, if you read Acts chapter 6, and you read verses 1 to 8, specifically the first five verses, you will note that deacons are servants to the apostles and the bishops. So to answer your question, if a bishop assigns the role, assigns a deacon, the role and responsibility to baptize someone, then that means a female deacon can do so under the authority of the bishop. You with me there? But it has to be done under the authority of the bishop. You with me there? Is that clear? The bishop stands in the place of the Lord Jesus Christ overseeing the church. The bishop, as long as he's a godly man who tries his best to live in perfect obedience to the will of the Lord Jesus, has the authority to say to the deacons, whether females or males, here, <clears throat> distribute the Lord's Supper. Here, baptize the following individual. Is everyone clear with me? By the way, Lord willing, in the description box, I will post links to the articles I wrote on women in the Holy Bible. I forgot to do that earlier. So to answer your question, if the bishop slash overseer slash elder, whom we call pastor, says to a female deacon, baptize this person, then that means yes. Is that clear? I just want to be clear on that. Well, airframe, that means prior to that, you didn't listen to my uh, sessions, I hope. Okay, now with that said, let's continue where we left off, trusting the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth and guide you into all truth and save me from error for the glory of Jesus. Holy Spirit, have your way. I just want to continue from where we left off yesterday. Here again, let's revisit 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 to 12, because I want to explain what that word silence means and doesn't mean by the grace of the Holy Spirit. No, why would women have to be married to baptize temple, temple bear? Don't add further restrictions and qualifications that the Bible doesn't temple bear. Where do you get that? Get what? Sinner saved by Christ. I hope you're not challenging me, sinner saved by Christ. If you haven't listened to the previous sessions, you have no right to ask me a question. If you have, let me know. Have you heard my previous sessions, the last two sessions on this? Let me just make sure real quickly. <sighs> It frustrates me. Too many chiefs, not enough Indians. Sinners saved by Christ. Okay, no, but did you listen to the previous sessions? Just want to make sure, because I don't want to address someone who hasn't listened to both sessions. You see, you didn't answer my question. You're wasting time. Okay, sinner. I love you for the sake of the Lord. Do not ask me a question if you haven't heard both sessions. When you hear both sessions and then you come to this session, I'm pretty certain by the grace of God's spirit, you'll have received your answer. Okay? Say, sinner, so I know I've seen you here and I know you love the Lord and you're not here to challenge me, but here's the thing. I'm assuming that the people who are listening have listened to the two previous sessions where I go very in-depth and now I'm finishing it off. So this is why I'm saying this, not to be rude, but I'm just trying to be honest. Now, Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Malach HaOlam. Please don't engage Andrew and ask him if he's come out. Trust the Holy Spirit, he's working on him. Let's focus for the glory of Jesus. Amen? Let's focus for the glory of Jesus. Okay? Now, let's go to 1 Timothy 2, 11 and 12. See, so Andrew Martin, did you hear what he just said? He said, strange as it may seem, I do not have atheism. Exactly. In your heart, you do love Jesus, and you're a believer, and I'll see you in glory, Andrew. In fact, you know what's amazing? A side note, Andrew shows more love and compassion to people who come here than I do, which is shocking, because when someone comes here and is a troublemaker or is argumentative, I bounce them, block them, but he keeps pleading with them, please, please don't argue, just listen and learn. Tell me this man is not an evangelist at heart. I've been noticing that. Yeah, I, 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 I'm telling you. I, I watch his comments. I see. He goes, please, guys, listen. Don't argue. Just learn. Please tell me this man is not in love with Jesus. He's not a believer. 
who has a heart for the lost. Okay? And it is an honor. Listen, let me tell you something. It is an honor and a privilege. In fact, I'm even being moved in my heart. That God would give me favor with a man like Andrew, that he'd come listen to me and to see him, see him with my own eyes falling in love with Jesus. In fact, I received a testimony today that really humbled me real quickly, really humbled me. An ex-Catholic monk, and he knows who he is, and I pray God will continue to use me to bless him and his life. He left two comments on my videos that humbled me, right? That God would actually use someone like me. See, I'm getting moved in my spirit. Right? I'm getting moved in my spirit. Because, folks, I have no formal education. From the world's standards, from the world's standards, from worldly standard, I'm a fool. I'm an idiot. Never been to college, never been to university, never been to seminary. For the Lord to then grant me the grace and favor by his spirit to be used by the spirit to glorify Jesus and to touch people, even people, scholars, is humbling, right? Right, so it, it, it's really humbling, especially this gentleman, the one I'm talking about, went to seminary, and here the Lord is using me to bless him. It's amazing. It's amazing. Well, that said, let's go back to 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 12. 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 12, as the Holy Spirit gives me unction to glorify Christ. Right? Let's look at it one more time because I want to unpack this word silence that may confuse people. Notice what he says. Let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. But I suffer not a woman to teach nor to assume authority over the man, but to be in silence. Now, the word silence can be confusing and may even <clears throat> cause people to misunderstand what Paul is saying. Here's what Paul is not saying. Here, I'm going to give you the link. Guys, please click on the link. Click on that link. See what the word is. You're going to see it's, I love these Greek words. Hesychia. Hesychia. Okay. Now, when you go there, you're going to click and see what hesychia means. Okay. Here it goes. Guys, don't take my word for it. Here's the link, please. I don't know what do you mean. I'm very different. Click on that, guys. Click on that. Okay, click on that. You hear what the word means. Notice what it says. It says stillness. Okay, let me read the lexicon. Understand what it means and what it doesn't mean. Quietness, stillness, silence. Helps word studies. Hisichia from hisichus. Quiet stillness, quietness implying calm. That's what I want you to pay attention. Calm for the believer used of their God-produced calm, which includes an inner tranquility that supports appropriate action. Do you see the meaning? You understand what it says? Do you see the meaning there? What does the word mean? Here it is. A calmness which includes an inner tranquility that supports appropriate action. This term does not mean speechlessness, which is more directly indicated by Sege. Did you catch it? You see, I'm not making this up, right? Then when you go to Thayer's lexicon, Isichius, Isichia, right, which, which see the feminine expresses the general notion, right? Quietness, descriptive of the life of one who stays at home, doing his own work, and does not officiously meddle with the affairs of others. Okay? Strong, exhaustive concordance. Feminine of hisichius. Stillness, desistance from bustle or language, quietness and silence. So what's the impl implication of this term? To confirm what I said yesterday by the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. The word means when Paul is telling these women to be silent, he's not saying be speechless, be dumb, say nothing. He's saying accept this instruction be at peace with it. Do not cause trouble and division by arguing and fighting <clears throat> and disagreeing with God's will for the role of males and females in the church. You understand what it's saying here? It's telling women not be speechless, be dumb, say nothing. Don't cause problems. Don't cause a division because you don't agree with the way God 
has set up the order and the structure of the church. You understand what he's saying here? Uh-oh. Here goes Hater Wood. Sorry, Hater Wood. I didn't want to take you 10 people from your live stream because this is the only time I could do live stream. So I don't want you to hate. As soon as I'm done, I want you to go to Hater Wood's live stream with the 20-minute apologist, even though his YouTube challenge is, cha channel is the one-minute apologist. Turns out it's the 20-minute apologist, right? Misleading people with a deceptive title. Right and be bored to tears. In fact, David Wood is the greatest cure to insomnia. If you suffer from insomnia, listen to him for a minute, and he'll knock you out for a week. And he's proof that purgatory exists. And I want you to hate hit that dislike button. All right. Anyway, are you with me here? So, did everyone see what the word doesn't mean? Does everyone see what the word doesn't mean? Is it clear? That in 1 Timothy 2, Paul is not saying that women should shut up and be mute. Exactly, Protestant. A man after my own, own heart. Protestant believer says, it's true. I listen to him as I'm going to bed. Okay. Did you just see the lexical proof that the word silence in 1 Timothy 2 is not saying that women are to shut up and be mute and say nothing? Is that clear? But you want to make sure you got it. Is everyone with me there? Do you see that it means instead of opposing this instruction, causing division, and fighting against God's order, be at peace with God's order and accept it? Airframe, make sure to go back and listen to all my sessions for the past two years because I trust by the power of the Holy Spirit you're going to find a lot of meat and your confidence in scriptures will be strengthened by the Spirit, and you'll fall more in love with the triune God. But is that clear now? Is anyone confused? Put a two, or tell me I'm confused. If it's clear, I can go to 1 Corinthians 14. Everyone clear? No one's confused. Okay. If that, if no, okay. So, Shirley, you're confused. Why, why are you confused at, Shirley? Surely, if you haven't had to pre listen to the previous two sessions, then go back and listen to them in depth. Because that will clarify most of your confusion. If you have, where, where are you confused? Because you put two. And I hope you're being sincere when you say two. Oh, okay, because you put two. You confused me. Two means it's not clear. Okay, Shirley, God bless you. All right. Now let's go to the other passage that's misapplied and misinterpreted to teach that women have nothing to say. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. And I'll be done with this issue. And we can go into other topics. And hopefully I won't have to address it again. And if you disagree with me, that's okay. And let me repeat again. If you disagree with me, that's okay. If you take a different position, that's okay. Let us agree to disagree because this is not an issue that's going to damn you to hell if you're wrong. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Right there, that seems so clearly to refute what I'm saying, right? Be silent in the church. You're not permitted to speak. And if you speak, it's a shame, right? How do we deal with this passage? First of all, if you take this passage and not try to understand it within its immediate overall context, you're going to end up with a contradiction. You're going to end up with a contradiction. Why? Because let's go to 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 and 5. Let me show you, Nathan, that it doesn't mean that. Here's what I want you to pay attention as the Holy Spirit guides me. 1 Corinthians 11, verses 4 and 5. I want you to hit that like button. Come on now. On my YouTube channel, Mercedes, it's there. Every man praying or prophesying have his head covered, dishonoreth his head. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered, dishonoreth her head, for that is even all one as if she were shaven. Now, here, if you don't understand what Paul means in 1 Corinthians 14, you have Paul contradicting himself. Focus, guys, by the power of the Holy Spirit. In chapter 11, 
He speaks of women who in a mixed congregation pray and prophesy with men. But he tells them how they're supposed to do it. When men pray and prophesy, they shouldn't cover their head. When women pray and prophesy, they should cover their head. But wait, Paul. Didn't you just say that women shouldn't speak at all? It's a shame. Are you contradicting yourself? You see the point, right? If you don't try to seek to understand what Paul is saying in context, you're going to end up pitting Paul against himself in the same letter. Because in 1 Corinthians 11, he is commenting on a practice observed by Christians where both males and females in the church pray and prophesy. Well, to pray, you can't be silent. To prophesy means to proclaim the word of God. You can't be silent. And he doesn't say, women, don't pray or prophesy at all. No, he says, when you pray and prophesy, make sure you're covered. In fact, it is so clear that Paul is teaching that women can pray and prophesy in the church, that you have liberal scholars and skeptics like Bart Ehrman claiming that 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35 is an interpolation. It was added to the epistle of Paul because Paul would not have said that because Paul clearly teaches that women can pray, prophesy, and have a role in the church. Are you aware of that? Here, let me prove it to you. Here's a link to Bart Ehrman, who actually uses 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, to prove that scribes added to Paul's letters in order to silence women, which clearly goes against what Paul taught about women. Here's the link. Are you ready for me to read what he has to say? Are you ready? Put one if you're ready. Because I want you to see that even liberals and skeptics clearly see from what Paul writes elsewhere that Paul has a high view of women and actually authorizes women to pray, to prophesy, to teach in the church so that they view 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 to be something added to the text which contradicts Paul's plain teaching. And I'm going to show you a dozen. But here, let me read. The non-Pauline Pauline oppression of women. Notice the title. The non-Pauline oppression of women, meaning scribes oppressed women by adding statements to Paul's letters in order to give the impression that it's Paul who's oppressing women, even though he doesn't. Let me read what he says. In my previous post, I argued that the view of women in 1 Timothy 2, 12 to 15, does not coincide with Paul's own teachings. Did you hear that? He goes, in my previous post, 1 Timothy 2, which I exegeted yesterday by the grace of God's spirit does not coincide with Paul's own teachings. And it, and that it, therefore, is probably not something that Paul wrote. Listen to what he says carefully. I gave you the link, so go read it on your own. This is a standard view among scholars that Paul did not write First and Second Second Timothy, Lord Jesus, loosen my tongue by the power of the Holy Spirit, that Paul did not write First and Second Timothy and Titus. There are compelling reasons for this view, which I could go into if anyone really wants to know. But Paul doesn't, but doesn't Paul say something similar in his undisputed letters and the harsh words of 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35? Indeed, this passage is so similar to that of 1 Timothy 2, 11 to 15, and so unlike what Paul says elsewhere, that many scholars are convinced that these two are words that Paul himself never wrote. Words that were later inserted into the letter of 1 Corinthians by a scribe who wanted to conform Paul's views to those of the pastoral epistles. The parallels are obvious when the two passages are placed side by side. And if I knew how to place them side by side in WordPress, <laughs> they would be placed side by side. So, well, here they are in sequence. And imagine each of the four number parts of the first passage is standing next to the corresponding number part of the second. Now, let me explain what, what Bartram is saying. He's saying that the consensus of biblical scholars, meaning liberal critical scholars, is that Paul did not, did not write First and Second Timothy and did not write Titus. They are called the pastoral epistles. And the majority of critical biblical scholars say Paul did not write those letters 
but those letters were forged in the name of Paul. Are you with me there? You understand what he's saying? So you're now getting a biblical education, an education of what critical scholars teach. Okay. Therefore, because Paul did not write 1 Timothy, one righteousness, you know I'm going to block you, right, for being that stupid to accuse me of that? Okay. <sighs> okay. Be because Paul did not write 1 Timothy, you cannot quote 1 Timothy 2 as representing Paul's perspective on the role of women in the church. No one righteousness. You're, you don't ask me a question if you've been following my blog and you've been following my YouTube session that shows that you are very stupid to accuse me of saying that God made a mistake. And because of that, you got to go. Leave my page. Okay? Sorry about that. You with me there? Sinners saved by Christ, you got to go too. You don't tell me what to do. Listen, folks, I don't think I've made myself clear. If you're that stupid enough to tell me what to do and to challenge me, you're in the wrong YouTube page. Get out of here. Get lost. I don't want you here. I don't get it. I mean, are these guys that stupid? Are they morons? Okay. Block these guys. Don't ever come back. Sir, you need to shut up before I muzzle you. Okay, thank you. Now, let's come back to the issue. Because they believe Paul did not write 1 Timothy, you cannot quote 1 Timothy 2 to show what Paul's view of women happened to be. Everyone with me there? That's what they claim. Moreover, because these same scholars, when they examine the letters that they claim Paul wrote, see that Paul had a very high view of women. On that basis, they argue that 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35, could not have been written by Paul, but it must have been inserted by later scribes to make Paul say something about women that he did not teach. You with me there? You understand what the argument is? You understand what the argument is? The argument is because Paul had such a high view of women, especially women in ministry, there is no way that he could have written 1 Corinthians 14, 35, 34 to 35, because 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 35 seems to contradict what Paul writes about women in that letter itself and in the genuine epistles attributed to Paul. Now, obviously they're wrong. Paul did write 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and it does not contradict his high view of women or what he says about women in ministry. It's misunderstood, misinterpreted. Are you with me there? And by the way, you even have conservative evangelical scholars that believe that 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 may have not been written by Paul. For example, one of the leading New Testament scholars and leading scholars of Paul, who's an evangelical Christian, who loves the triune God and worships the Lord Jesus Christ happens to be Gordon D. Fee. Gordon Fee. He believes that 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 may have been inserted into the epistle of 1 Corinthians because he thinks that the manuscript tradition shows that it may have been an insertion and also doesn't comport with what Paul says about women in ministry. And he's a conservative Christian who's an evangelical who believes the Bible is inspired, inerrant, and preserved, and a Trinitarian. You understand what I'm getting at? Let me again explain what's my point. 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35 seems to be so out of place with what Paul writes elsewhere because Paul clearly says women do have an active role in the church because in the church they can pray and prophesy that it seems so odd for him to later say, women be silent, I don't allow you to speak, it's a shame for you to speak, which seems to contradict what he says earlier about women speaking in the church. Do you understand the point? Before I move on, do you understand the point? 
Because now I'm going to show you there is no contradiction. And he's not saying women cannot speak in any sense. That's a gross misinterpretation of 1 Corinthians 14, 34, 35. But I want to make sure you understand what the point is and why even scholars can see that Paul clearly teaches in passages such as 1 Corinthians 11, women can actively speak and have an active role in mixed congregations where males and females are present. Okay, now, if, if you got that part, this confirms what I said previously, that though the Bible is for us, all the books of the Bible are preserved by the Holy Spirit for our instruction today. Even though it's for us, it wasn't written to us. 1 Corinthians was not written for Christians in the 21st century, was not, not, say, not written for. Let me correct myself. Holy Spirit, save me from error for the glory of Jesus. 1 Corinthians was not written to. It is for us. All the books of the Bible are for all Christians and all agents until Jesus returns. But it wasn't written to us. 1 Corinthians was not written to Christians in the 21st century, whether in the UK or in America or in Africa or the Netherlands. You with me there? Though 1 Corinthians is for us, for our benefit and instruction, it wasn't written to us. Why is that important? Because when the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write this letter, he was writing to a particular group of Christians at Corinth addressing their particular needs. Let me know when the buffering stops. It's still buffering here. My goodness.